when it blows through my bones. I got a dose for it. Wanna know more? Cause it's about what I got to show for it. He's a real fucking menace. My my new puppy, he's a fucking menace. He's recovering. Right, he's now. A, yeah, no, I didn't fucking yeah, no, my puppy's running around, he's jumping, he's pretty it's as if nothing ever happened, you know. I mean he's obviously he's got the metal plate in his in his uh in his leg, but he's doesn't seem to bother him. Yeah, Molotov yeah, is uh, great. Yeah, it's good that Vyacheslav Mihailovich is doing good. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel my fucking brain swelling already. Vitam Tavashashita is Polinkash and um we are going to be doing another episode. What is this? Episode uh, eight, nine, I think eight. Eight, I think. I think it was twelve. Episode episode twenty seven of Big Brain University. Episode one. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first one. There have been none. Of, there have been no previous episodes. Um, but yeah, so we're gonna I be mean, watching. It's, it's been like it's been like ten years since you uploaded. So I mean, it's it basically may as well be the first one. It has been a little while <laughs> since the last Big Brain. A lot of people have been messaging me about it, being like, "Yo, where the fuck is the next Big Brain?" And like, I'm sorry, but I'm I'm a labor organizer, and my time is taken up extensively with that. Besides my other political work, so let's just get into it. We're gonna the first video we're gonna watch is why you should be a nationalist. This, this sounds like it's gonna be a hood classic. Britain votes to leave the European Union. The United States elects a president who says he'll put America first. Around the world, nationalism is winning elections. Many see this nationalist revival as the great danger of our time, fearing that nationalism will take us back to a more primitive and racist past. But it wasn't long ago that great political figures, figures such as Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt, David <laughs> Ben-Gurion and Mahatma Gandhi, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, Hell recognized yeah. what I call <laughs> the virtue of nationalism. The vir so what is this virtue? <laughs> yeah, Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi's virtue of nationalism. <laughs> 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 so funny. Man, what a that that's a you know, and I saw somebody comment on this video too. Like the top comment on the video is fucking hilarious because they were literally like uh Prager U says we should thank uh the British Empire for freedom and democracy. And also <laughs> that's Mahatma, right. but also Mahatma Gandhi is a virtuous hero. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, they had like two, two different videos just, just like sucking the British Empire's yes. dick and they just other one. It's like, yep, Gandhi, good guy. Yeah, just sucking off. I, I think we did that one, didn't we? It was fucking like maybe maybe somebody else did it, but um, I I did definitely watched a video where somebody was reacting to uh, that the British Empire one, and it's just it's fucking hilarious. A nationalist believes that the world is governed best when nations are free to chart their own independent course cultivating their oh, traditions yeah. and pursuing That's their interests. That's what it means. Damn, is this what a guy reading Stalin do? What the fuck? Comrade? This is, yeah. This, <laughs> <laughs> this is a really, this is a very, like, odd definition. By this standard, it's like every single country in the world is fucking nationalist. But every nation state, by the definition of nation state, pursues its own interests, you know? Like, obviously, we have international... Uh, cooperation between nations, whatever. So, uh, certain countries pretend to put um, the world, uh, f the, you know, the world outside of just their country first. Uh, let's be real here. Um, there are no nation states that actually do that because capitalism doesn't allow for that kind of genuine international cooperation the fascists always start by saying like like it's we don't hate anybody or we don't want to oppress anybody we just think that every nation and every race or whatever should just govern themselves and like be be separate and be free and do whatever and like preserve their own culture that's what they always like start by saying then in actual practice it always turns into well they actually do hate other nations and they do hate other races and they do think that only their nation is good and their nation and their race is superior and that uh, it's actually legitimate for them to pursue their interest, which means, you know, conquer other people's uh, territory, steal other, other nations' uh, wealth and uh, oppress and enslave other nations. That, like, that's what nationalism is. They always say, oh, we just want to, like, have our own rights and pursue our interests, but nationalism, it always turns into actually being against other <clears throat> nations and not just being pro your nation. It always comes at the expense of an other, right? In nationalist ideology, there's always an other, some kind of uh, external force uh, that threatens the, the Volksgemeinschaft, right? 
uh, or an internal intruder, right? Uh, some kind of parasite that exists within society, uh, within the cultural, the, com- the you know, the cultural community nation, right? And that's precisely what Hitler's nationalism was about, right? It was about the Volksgemeinschaft, uh, organic community of a people of a particular culture. And of course, when you set up your ideology in that way, uh, of course, the other, there's always going to be an other uh, because fascism feeds on a manufactured threat. Like you should be patriotic in the sense that you like you love your own uh, people, the masses, and you want to do what's best for the masses. But then uh, you don't want to be like some outsider to the masses of your of your nation and your country. But at the same time, you have to be an internationalist because internationalists actually want self determination for all nations, and they want friendship and cooperation between nations actually in socialism it is actually in the interest of every nation to cooperate and have friendship instead of having like wars or something but that's not what nationalism is like nationalism arises because you you have capitalism in one one country so you have national capitalism and then it grows and it becomes bigger and then it needs to go uh looking for external markets and places where it can expand and then it becomes imperialist so it solidifies itself as a nation state right to consolidate not only its own national interest but it's also like of course it's capital because na- nationalism is just like a it's just the the veil over the real class interests that are occurring in that or this country you know yeah like what capitalist nation or what capitalist state like supposedly respects other countries uh, self determination like none of them do <laughs> i mean essentially like if your nationalism threatens like uh capital extraction or profit i mean it's just like your type of nationalism is uh, not good but if it's the other way then hell yeah bro fucking nationalism all the way <laughs> one race one country <laughs> like um uh, one brain one brain <laughs> one, big one brain, brain one race <laughs> <laughs> without interference nationalism is the opposite of imperialism or globalism or transnationalism which are all names <laughs> for the attempt to bring peace I mean, and prosperity and you might as well say jews at this point like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> like it's not entirely false but it's also not entirely true like they're the opposite only in the sense that like first when capitalism develops it develops a domestic market and it becomes national capitalism and then when it it uh, grows it becomes a global and transnational capitalism but it's like you're comparing and contrasting like an earlier stage of capitalism to the mature stage of capitalism so it's it's like saying oh a puppy is the opposite of a dog like strange to say (laughs) that like a puppy is good while a dog is bad like the puppy is gonna become the dog like no matter what you do it's literally reaction like they want to go back to where we're just a bunch of nation states you know vying and compete i mean it's like it's the same shit with like uh oh we should just like distribute like property so that you know there'd be more competition but it just like it doesn't they don't realize it's that it it will always consolidate into either big ha- monopoly capitalist or a big and global imperialist power right from but nationalism I mean, or from like small proprietorships to like monopolies and big imperialist states like i mean what the fuck i mean that's the key thing here right is like nationalism and imperialism are not mutually exclusive like uh yeah they are they are like, like finney was saying it's it's a it's a half truth because like yeah you can sh- like you could say like okay the like it, these concepts in their abstract form are opposite but they're not mutually exclusive and uh, they can actually feed into each other and they do, they have, they can, they, and they will continue to do so, right? Like that, that's the point. It's a dynamic relationship. Yeah, they're not necessarily the opposite at all because um, like they're basically advocating a reactionary utopia where they say that, uh, they say that late stage capitalism is bad and we need to go back to the earlier stage of capitalism, which is obviously impossible to do. It's just, uh, it's a reactionary utopia because it, it advocates a return to some mythical past that is both impossible and we just shouldn't do that. We should instead go forward instead of going backwards. At the same time, like, it's just false because, uh, like you said, imperialism also uses nationalism. So even, like, the United States, is, it's nationalist as hell, but it's also not actually national capitalism anymore. It's imperialist capitalism that oppresses other countries. And they advocate nationalism, so... Let's say that they support, like, 
all the various like right-wing nationalist governments in uh, in Europe. Those countries, they can be nationalist, but that doesn't mean that they go back to a pre-monopoly, pre-imperialist capitalism. No, they will continue to develop in, in an imperialist way, but they will just pretend like that's not the case. And they will also use nationalism for that purpose. So nationalism actually will only support imperialism and not hinder it in any way. There can also be another version of imperialism, like the EU and NATO. They're both imperialist, but they're also international blocks of uh, a bunch of different countries. Imperialism can also advocate, you know, what they call like globalism or some shit. Like imperialism can also advocate globalism or some kind of like world state or whatever. Like after the Second World War, there were a number of imperialist theoreticians who openly advocated a world state that should have its headquarters in Washington. What would such a world state look like? It's just the United States like ruling the world, basically. It's not actually any kind of true like world state where all countries cooperate it's just the u.s conquers the whole fucking world and what is what is nato like nato is the u.s like subordinating other countries what is the eu just the biggest imperialist states in europe like germany just subordinating uh, other countries by uniting mankind under a single political authority the debate between nationalists and globalists then is over whether we should aspire to a world of many independent nations or to be one unified superstate, like the enlightened federation of the Star Trek movies. A case can be made for both sides of the argument, but for the last 30 years, really since the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the end of the Soviet Union, the one world side has been dominant. Today, this is changing, uh -huh. maybe not among elites, but among ordinary citizens, or as they're known in America, the deplorables. It turns out that a lot of people still think <laughs> good borders make good neighbors. It's hardly surprising that people want to preserve. Them. Yes, yes, good borders make good neighbors. I mean, that's just hilarious. like the border question is like just so fucking hilarious because, I mean, good borders. You know, like Trump's immigration policy, his border policy, uh, continued to um, be active since uh, just recently. Um, which Biden just kind of like reinstituted Trump's policy, uh, but made it put put a smiley face on it, you know, um, and sent the army in. Yeah, and sent the army in. But like you got like you like good border. Like if that's what good borders are, like you got motherfuckers like just getting wh literally whipped by border guards on horses and shit, just getting like beaten. It's like, you know, there's like encampments outside of the fucking uh, border of like all these immigrants who are just trying to get away from violence and like poverty um, created by the United States. I mean, like as of, as of late, like there's been a, there's been tons of um, Venezuelan and Cuban and Haitian immigrants because they have, uh, they have increased the um the uh what's it called the the sanctions on cuba biden increased the sanctions on cuba the sanctions on venezuela uh obviously the the global economy has um has has gotten significantly worse and so those countries are especially affected by the sanctions and then haiti of course has this giant um not only like the natural disasters which still affect the country to this like you know the the natural disasters in the past decade that continue to affect the country to this day because of austerity but also the just the crazy political situation in Haiti right now created by the United States so like uh, like a large and you know let's not even like get into like how the CIA has sponsored the Mexican cartels and so uh, you know a very large uh, section of um, immigrants those who are trying to get in um, are literally there because of U.S. policy. And whether you have, uh, like, the strength of your borders is not going to make your relationship any better with the countries around you, uh, you know, especially when you're forcing austerity on them. So it's just completely fucking delusional, like, this, this statement. Do you consider that maybe you just don't understand what it means to be a good neighbor? That's not, not a very neighborly thing to say, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe that's what like it is. Maybe. maybe maybe I need to go back to church, I guess. So. The way of yeah, life. you know he they, fucking that guy who whipped the fucking like the Haitian immigrant was just like in his mind he was like, yeah. 
Yeah, like, yeah like, 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 living out living out his uh, lost cause fantasy on the, on the fucking <laughs> on the on the border of Texas, <laughs> just whip whipping Haitians on the back of a horse. You know, he's just holy just, fuck, just living out his fucking fantasy of of the. Oh, you haven't seen that, Finny? You didn't see? You I have haven't not. seen that? Oh my god, no. it's fucking! It's like literally just like border patrol agents on horseback whipping Haitian immigrants with like whips, with like actual like, whips, yeah. like running them down on horses and shit. It's actually fucking insane. And you know, yeah, and like, and like, you know, and all those guys they got like Texas accents and shit, so they're just like, yeah, buddy, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Woo! Just like you know, you already know <laughs> yeah. what they say. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. That, that's right get that <laughs> their answer that's right the, you know, you're right the way of life they believe is best it's human nature our strongest loyalties are to those who are closest to us to our family then the larger community or tribe and oh, yeah, this is like such, oh my god. Long this is just such a like anti-historical argument to say like how nationalism is somehow like inherent to human nature. Like nations did not always exist. Nation states did not always exist. Like yeah, people used to live in like tribal communities, in city states, in uh, towns and village communities throughout the Middle Ages. Like in the Middle Ages, people would consider themselves like maybe Christian. But they wouldn't, like, have a fucking clue of what a fucking nation-state is. Only with the rise of capitalism did you have modern nation-states. Just totally ignorant and naive to say that, like, to be conscious of the, the concept of a, of a nation or a nation-state somehow inherent to human nature. Like, you don't see fucking cavemen creating nation states Th this reminds me of um that that fucking uh, that dude that was like saying like yeah you know i'm a when it comes to my children i'm a communist when it comes to my family i'm a socialist when it comes to my uh, community i'm a libertarian when it comes to my uh uh <laughs> when, oh no when it comes to my state i'm a democrat when it comes to uh uh, or my city. When it comes to my state, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Republican. And when it comes to my nation, I'm a Libertarian. It's just like it's such a like confused like conception uh, of of what when politics is. Sex, <laughs> when it comes to my sex life, I'm a Nazi. But uh, like yeah, you just gotta fucking, you just gotta just dominate. <laughs> um, I like the. I mean, like, what would be like the first like like you know because nation states are artificial, right? They're created so like. You would all agree, like France would be like 1789 France or 1793 France was like the first like nation state on the modern like in in terms of modern history. No? I think I think nation states de I think nation states developed a little bit earlier than that. I would say that like the Thirty Years' War was kind of like when nation states really became like uh, an idea that was floating around, um, and then like past that point, there was just kind of a slow development. I would say that, yeah, like the French Revolution was probably like the first like complete integration of the idea of the nation state into uh, the common ideology, right? Certainly it was because they thought that uh, when the king fled, they started saying that the king is a traitor to the nation. Your allegiance wasn't towards like a, an artifact, like a, a, an idea of a nation, it was more towards a lord or a fucking baron or the king itself right on his your allegiance to the king and to his property and to his subjects instead of allegiance to a nation which was much more prevalent in 1789 even more so like like you said after the king fled and the the, the republican france or no not even republican france just like france itself was like declaring him a traitor to the nation yeah i mean ultimately feudal politics was was structured on um like tributary loyalty but there's another thing that i wanted to kind of say about this pyramid i mean first of all like the idea of a human nature is like fallacious on its own like you know that it's literally a fallacy um, loyalty <laughs> and but it's like you know these things don't have to be oppositional right like your family does not have to be the interest of your family does not have to be oppositional to the interest of your nation when it is oppositional then that's that's obviously a signal of a of a problem and in capitalism the reason why the interests of the nation or even the interests of the community uh is contrary to 
um, the family or say the interest of the nation is contrary to the interest of the community, it's because of class struggle, right? It's because the state is structured in such a way that it that it uh, pursues the interests of the ruling class at the expense of the lower classes, especially the working class. The whole point of having a, a civilization, the whole point of having a community is to exist uh, collectively in pursuit of the same interests, right? That's why humans came together in the first place on like the fundamental level but he's just making like a basically the a tribalist argument he's just saying like oh well the people who are closest to you and most similar to you you like them everybody else sucks so you should just be like scared of uh, outsiders freedom is to build political life out of this natural loyalty by putting decision making in the hands of the family the community and the independent nation you could get people to cooperate with one another join in the common defense and willingly obey laws. You see, see like that, that's like the, that was the thing that I was talking about earlier, right? These, these very, uh, these very like, like easy to miss implications of an other, right? Common defense, defense against who? They're obviously implying some kind of threat, right? Some, some, they're obviously implying that there's something there that is trying to damage the community, the, 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 the organic nation, right? But also, uh, uh, I wanted to add more thing about uh, add one more thing about the previous uh, conversation. Like Finney was saying, like the idea of the nation state is pretty like recent. They they treat that like structure, that like structure of loyalty, as being like uh, eminent and eternal. But the idea of the nation is a, in the grand scheme of human history, it's a recent invention. So, uh, but this is typical for for conservatives. They act like their values um, that they promote have been and will be everlasting. The only alternative to this kind of community and nation-based politics is to use force, to coerce obedience. In the 20th century, communism and Nazism huh. both sought huh. to impose oh a universal vision at gunpoint. Both the communists oh, yeah, the Nazis, and the Nazis. Oh, yeah, the Nazis. They were Yeah, the, na yeah the, <laughs> the I wonder what na Nazi stands for. It couldn't possibly be <laughs> national <laughs> socialist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like then that's and that's like really the great thing, too, is like, you know, they the the Nazis were like so nationalist that they couldn't even just be like, yeah, no, we're socialists. No, they had to add the national part to make it clear that they're nationalists. So it's just, you know, it's hilarious. I mean, you think they like um like prayer you like copied like you know adolf hitler's like homework and shit and like yeah, they, you know they're like <laughs> they're just like making this you know they're making the same shit but you know who's you know you know whose handwriting is that there were two famous people uh after world war one who uh, theorized about the right of nations to self-determination uh one was lenin and then who who the who, the, who was the what's the name of the bourgeois guy i forget woodrow wilson uh he advocated national self-determination when uh trying to like solve the the issue after world war one like what to do with all the various uh, participants in the war so they like obviously imposed the versailles treaty on germany and they also split like the austro-hungarian empire into its uh, various national uh, components but the bourgeois like advocates of uh, national self-determination they were completely full of shit because they, in practice didn't respect the self-determination of nations so I don't know, it's just funny, he says that, oh, communists and Nazis, they were the internationalists who tried to, like, impose their will on people, when, when like, the Nazis were not internationalists, they were, they were nationalists, and the communists, oh, they supposedly tried to impose their will on people when they were the ones who, like, were pushing for self-determination of nations. Like, think about the communist revolutions that happened in various countries, like, the Russian Revolution, the Hungarian Revolution, the Finnish Revolution, all of them suffered invasion from those same bourgeois fuckers who uh, who were talking about like uh, self-determination like they invaded russia they invaded finland they invaded hungary uh, i mean yeah they yeah like literally that they, no they're of course they're full of shit um but this is just this is just reminding me of uh of uh inter nazis <laughs> what uh what was it what was the uh, uh uh shit what was his name uh oh, tick tick yeah Takes, uh, oh, I knew it. Yeah, takes takes concept of uh, the inter Nazi. You know, communists are just inter Nazis. Fucking hilarious. These were imperialists. They wanted to eliminate <laughs> the independent <laughs> nations of the world. Nationalism holds uh. that borders are crucial. The border is where each nation's ambitions should stop. This idea first appears in the Bible, 
where Moses gives <laughs> homage to Israel. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be punished if they trouble their neighbors. True, <laughs> it's okay, so what the fuck? In the Bible, they never fucking conquer any anybody else's things and never fucking enslave foreign populations, right? And like, the US certainly has never fucking moved its borders anywhere. Like, they certainly haven't conquered anybody else's territory, right? Right, yeah, no. Never it's, interfered anywhere. It's basically like, yeah, borders are important, but... We didn't say you can't expand your borders. <laughs> well, like, only the U.S. can, like nobody else can. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century made the independent nation-state the political cornerstone of the modern world. When Henry VIII declared that England would no longer obey dictates from Rome, he became Europe's first true nationalist. That's, that's so fucking, that is so fucking stupid. Oh, my God. Dude, my fucking brain is like three times expanded. It's like fucking Megamind up in here. Megamind. Yeah, like, damn. <laughs> Protestant Reformation is like somewhat connected to nationalism in the sense that like, yeah, Protestant Reformation was part of the destruction of feudalism and the rise of capitalism, which also gave rise to nation states. But yeah, it is a stretch to say like, oh, Martin Luther like made uh, fucking nationalism the cornerstone of uh, what whatever he said. I mean, Jesus Christ, like, th this shows, like, how fucking lazy these dumbasses are. Like, like it could have used, like, they could have used Cromwell, which, I mean, like, it's a, it's if iffy, but, like, they could have used that, and they even, they couldn't even do their yeah, own fucking first, homework. I mean, obviously, they don't want to use him, because he's, you know, he was a revolutionary, so, you know, they don't like that. Revolutionary in terms of, like, getting rid of the king. But like, other than that, well, it's but just also like, yeah. establishing like a like a like a republic, you know, like establishing like like yes, it was a the it was a theocratic republic, but like it was still like I mean, besides like a lot of the bullshit, you know, Puritan rules that they established, like it was def it was like certainly a progressive force in history from like the the the, the traditional like feudal relationship. So no, I don't buy, I don't buy it. <laughs> you don't buy what? <laughs> I don't. My brain's bigger than yours, and I don't buy it. <laughs> you don't buy that Cromwell was a revolutionary. No. This is like a weird tangent, but usually the critique of Cromwell is just uh, his policy on Ireland, which like, yeah, that's a valid uh, critique, but I mean, he was attacking feudalism. Well, they weren't trying to do revolution, like they were just trying to fucking make England function better and to like get King Charles to not, you know, fuck with them and start like ending parliament every time. And so like his, his death came entirely up to him. Like and Charles like literally just made it easy for them to like kill him. And at that point, they were like, well, I guess we got to fucking, you know, make a republic. They were basically just like more operating in the dark in terms of like, because it was like a brand new kind of thing. Yeah, right? I mean, well, just, yeah. I mean, but the thing is, is like the fact, well, that, th that alone, like the fact that they did overthrow the monarchy and establish a republic, like that is a revolutionary act. Not every historical revolutionary has to be as good as the socialists, you know? Like there are plenty of uh, revolutionaries of the classical era that were definitely bad guys. I think all of our, I think Oliver Cromwell was definitely a bad guy, but he was still a revolutionary ultimately, you know? I guess. No, okay, now you've, I, I turned 180 on this. Since <laughs> <laughs> declared their independence. The Dutch from Spain and America from Britain to cite just two examples. The competition among these newly independent peoples led to an explosion of innovation, bringing unprecedented progress in science, industry, and government. They were establishing a bourgeois order and they were overthrowing feudalism. Right. Again, it's a it's a half truth, you know. Like I'm, I'm sure. Uh... I'm sure we'll see what kind of bullshit he's going to say about this. Years, the principle of national independence served as the foundation for a better, freer world. A principle, this is just, this is just, this is literally just the development of capitalism. Like, this is just literally the development of capitalism. Like, <laughs> principle Pure of ideology. National, like, principle of national it's independence, like, uh, yeah, like, the nation state was a, is a, an essential part of the capitalist mode of production. And it was precisely like after the Protestant Reformation that the ideas of capitalism really started to take hold. So, I mean, like this is this literally like this is just tied to capitalism. This is, you know, like and capitalism obviously does not respect in any genuine way uh, rights of self-determination. So, you know, is Prager you anti-NATO? I don't think so. <laughs> They're pro-Israel. Yeah. So that, that tells you enough. Yeah, nationally. That would be great. So, like, 
they should dismantle NATO, they should, you know, abolish and, like, close down all the U.S. military bases all over the world, they should stop, like, uh, American corporations from interfering and exploiting other countries, they should stop the U.S. from militarily intervening uh, everywhere, like, yeah, I'm in favor of all that, like, national independence is good, but capitalism cannot facilitate that and instead he's just making these demagogic points about how you need to be a nationalist which supposedly brings you all these good things you know to the oil tycoons that um fund prager you you know put your money where your mouth is dismantle nato lobby to dismantle nato if you really believe what what this what this video is saying I think dismantle we'll... nato dismantle the fucking eu dismantle the, the oil refineries the fucking the the, the oil wells, I just kind of everything. Yeah. But World War One and World War Two changed everything. Traumatized uh. by these catastrophic conflicts, many now seek mm. comfort in a simplistic narrative, ceaselessly repeated. That oh, nationalism yeah. Everybody else is so World simplistic, but Prager U is <laughs> nuanced as fuck. Yeah, <laughs> so nuanced. Nationalism caused the two world. I don't. I mean. Yes, that's what the that's what the liberals and the neoliberals. Um, have been teaching the West forever, but uh, no, capitalism caused the two world wars. Uh, pretty fucking like explicitly, pretty fucking obviously, capitalism caused it. Yeah, right? and nationalism is attached to capitalism, of course, uh, because the nation state is essential to the functioning of capitalism. But capitalism is a much more fundamental force in history, and it was precisely capital interests that caused. Uh, world War II, particularly, uh, I mean, the, both the World Wars, but in World War II, particularly the desire to destroy communism, because that's why the fucking West sponsored uh, Hitler in the first place, because they wanted Hitler to destroy the Soviet Union, to finally put an end to communism. And then obviously they created a monster that they couldn't control. And that's what World War II in, in very simplistic terms was. I mean, so, same thing with fucking uh, Mussolini and shit. I mean, he got paid, he got a stipend from like the fucking British government for like years, no? Right. Well, you know, and but they and they were both tasked to kill communism within their own countries too, right? Like yeah. Mussolini broke all the unions, uh, Hitler broke all the unions. Um, you know, I mean, it's it, it was to destroy communism within, um, but also to uh, to destroy um, the international hub of communism, which was the Soviet right. Union. So. I mean, to like yeah, to give a brief like wrong view of like how why why we think capital like caused like World War One. Basically, like over time, like capital like capital itself develops in these nation states in which it grows and grows to the point where you know industrial capital and finance capital, like the financial sector, merge together into form the like, finance capital, and in doing so, see or to expand their capital in not just its own nation, but abroad. Essentially, that came down to butting heads in interest between the German finance capitalists and the, the fucking British and French finance capitalists concerning colonial exploits. Right, and let's also uh, you know, mention the economic crisis that happened just before World War II, which is what really, ultimately, you know, obviously, like, they say that the Great Depression ended in, like, the early 30s, but, like, really, the effects kind of continued throughout the 30s. Um, but, yeah, Hitler kind of, he got elected at, like, the, the peak of the global economic depression. Um, but th that's the point, right, is that the capitalists see, and in this case, you have different camps of capitalists, right? So you have the capitalists of the West, uh, the, of America, the capitalists of the British, the capitalists of the French, the Germans. Essentially, when um, capitalists see that their profits are falling, which is what was happening in the Depression, they start to take drastic measures to um, recoup their profits. And in the case of the German national bourgeoisie, uh, and like also in the case of like dealing with the, so the Soviet Union, it was really the international bourgeoisie, uh, basically, um, we're like, okay, well, our profits are falling. We have to um, crush the unions. We have to uh, increase austerity and we have to expand our markets. And the Soviet Union was the perfect target for the expansion of markets because it was an insanely large country, plenty of land, plenty of people to enslave, effectively enslave. And, uh, and, and so ultimately like World War II was caused by the, like specifically the uh, tendency of the falling rate of profit uh, in capitalism, as well as crisis, crisis of overproduction. 
So th this whole idea of nationalism, and, I, and you know, they're just about to like critique this idea, but I promise you they're not going to give the right analysis. But of course, this whole idea of nationalism being the key element in the cause of uh, the world wars um, is, is just uh, beyond stupid. They completely failed to see that in, in like World War II, for instance, there was reactionary nationalism on one side, so like all the aggressive uh, fascist imperialist states like Germany, they were all like nationalist as hell. And then all the countries that they attacked, like Soviet Union, uh, like Czechoslovakia, all those countries, PragerU would also probably have to consider them nationalists as well, even though they were really just, they were patriotic. Like for the Soviet Union, they called it the Great Patriotic War. And like Czechoslovakia, they uh, they had like a national national front to defend their country from Nazi invasion. And uh, China had like a national front to defend itself from a Japanese invasion. Some people might say that they were like progressive nationalists, but I think we really shouldn't use the term nationalist for that because nationalism really is like a reactionary ideology. While those countries, they advocated uh, friendship between countries, but they also did want to defend their own sovereignty. So like in that sense, because PragerU doesn't see any difference between like reactionary nationalism and democratic uh, patriotism or democratic countries trying to defend themselves. Prager you just uh, sees them both as nationalists, I guess. So how does how exactly does it even make sense to say like nationalism uh, caused or did not cause the war? Like it's uh, it's just like a sort of a separate issue. If from their point of view, there would have been nationalists on both sides anyway. This is one of the great untruths of our time. Adolf Hitler was no nationalist. He was an imperialist. If his ambitions had been Bruh. limited to ruling Germans, it would have been terrible for Germany. But the French, the British, the Russians, and everyone else would have been spared a world war. Sadly, European huh. elites learned the wrong lesson, believing that independent nations are inherently dangerous. Better, they reasoned, that all countries should live under one government. In 1992, this vision gave birth to the European Union. They just don't like that somebody else is also building an empire that, like, that there's the EU bloc that also, like, is contesting the European markets while the US would like to get all that for itself. Like, they criticize the EU, which is fine, but like, why don't they criticize NATO? I mean, yeah, like, it's just completely, um, it's completely hypocritical. British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher hated the idea. She didn't want the bureaucrats in Brussels making decisions for Brits in Birmingham. <laughs> but in the utopian 1990s, Britain thought it was better to dump Thatcher and go with Brussels. It's the spirit of Margaret Thatcher. Oh, yeah, the utopian European Union. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, like the, di the dick sucking from Margaret Thatcher and Raw Reagan is like too much. Oh, of like... course. No, of course. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, everybody who's watching right now, if you have the opportunity, piss on Margaret Thatcher's grave. Indeed. Oh, my, the... All my English brothers. Oh, my out God. There. Wait, wait. Let's see. Let's see what this is. I'm, all, I'm already. I'm already afraid yes. of what he was, was about to be said with, with the introduction <laughs> of this character in the picture. Uh, oh, no. That reasserted itself in Britain's vote for independence from Europe in June 2016. <laughs> Donald Trump tapped into the same... Oh, okay. So they're basically just saying that Margaret Thatcher was like Henry... The <laughs> this is fucking... <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, oh, yeah. No, now they're going to talk about Trump. Spirit of nationalism. Five months later, in November 2016 nationalism is making a comeback so when trump like went to saudi arabia and like sucked all like the saudi prince's cocks like was that nationalism uh yeah, yeah i'm checking it i'm fact checking it and uh yeah it seems correct <laughs> <laughs> checks out you know yeah trump yep. is definitely uh committed to america <laughs> america <laughs> within its own borders definitely has no interests outside of america whatsoever if you care about freedom you should hope it succeeds. I'm Yoram Chazoni, author of The Virtue of Nationalism. Nobody cares. Uh, yeah, nationalism uh, is freedom. Uh, that <laughs> That is um, the takeaway. So I hope you all uh, learned a lot from that video. I know I did. I learned that <laughs> Margaret Thatcher is a successor to Henry the uh, Henry the Eighth, and the uh, communists uh, and Nazis are, are, the, are the same as usual. You know, this is well-known fact. By the way, uh, PragerU merch, uh, go out, go out and buy this. Go out and buy this merch. This is a good merch. They got a. Hey, imagine the, having a PragerU umbrella. Next episode, our next video, 
Uh, no, I don't want to. Fuck, I wish I... Welcome to Los Angeles, the second most populous city in the USA and the heart of sunny Southern California. Its That's residents, right. known as Angelinos, enjoy the city's beaches, hiking trails, museums, theme parks, sports venues, and acclaimed universities. But this rapid expansion of people and culture has also come with some growing pains. And when tensions turn to violence, Angelinos must rely on a strained police force for protection. Yes, when uh, when when the uh, un unbridled accumulation of capital has some growing pains, we have to use the state to oppress uh, the. <laughs> We're just dealing with the growing pains. We gotta just let capital uh, ex accumulate, you know, without any restriction. And if you have a problem with that, or if you're, uh, you know, or if you're put in a bad position because of that, um, you know, it's just growing pains, and the police are gonna solve that problem. A little bit, like, and when the and when different people just. Uh, come together naturally it's going to cause problems it's like when when you have race <laughs> yeah. mixing it's going to have problems it's going to be yeah when, of course as usual We're gonna when, have uh, when many different types of people come to one place of course they're going to just hate each other because one of the re one of the races is the superior one so uh, <laughs> so yeah um 